Welcome everybody back here um, at Siegel Talks, uh, this time combined with office hours from NYU uh, Skirball. And we have um, with us, um, I think, one of the extraordinary artists of our time, uh, of Europe, but I think the global uh, sense of uh, world uh, theater. They are invited to come to NYU Skirball, the improbable theater, and uh, Phelim McDermott is with us. Phelim, welcome. Hello, everybody. Nice, nice to be with you. Nice to be with you. How are you today? I, I, I'm good. I'm, I'm excited and a little bit nervous. Uh, you know, we're, we're about to do the show in New York, uh, Dow of Glass, and uh, it's, um, I, it's a show that I really care about a lot. Um, and uh, so it's got that good mixture of excitement of really wanting to share the show and uh, nervousness about our, our opening on Thursday. Incredible. You just came from North Carolina where you have, I think, one show only, and yeah. now you're going to be for two weeks with us in NYU. Nice. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. J Jay Weckman invited you, and the great uh, Jay DeLeon also connected us. And um, I'm, I would like to say uh, thank you um, for, um, for, for collaborating with us. The show, if I understand right, it's an exploration of life, loss, and, and the question with us inspiration come from what happens when we dream because Jung once said the dreams are the only things that hasn't happened yet look at cities someone built them even when we see someone passing by till the eye puts it into our brain there's a delay a leopard runs faster but uh, in our dreams um, everything comes together and you together was the the, the the Philip Glass that one the great master of uh, contemporary music, a, a grandmaster, a classic already, you know, you've worked together a lot. Um, and it's a very, very personal work, the Tower of Class. So tell us a little bit how, uh, what was the inspiration for the play about inspiration and, and theater? Um, you know, it, it, it is an interesting piece because it's, and I say this in the show itself, it's, it's a piece about, um, what happens when something else doesn't happen. So as part of the story, there is a, a show that was going to happen that Philip and I were gonna do, and it was a, an adaptation of a Maurice Sendak uh, storybook mm -hmm. in the night kitchen. And that, that fell through and didn't happen. So I was working with the Manchester Festival, uh, John McGrath at the Manchester Festival. And he, he said, well, you know, this show isn't gonna happen as we thought. Well, what 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 would you really like to do with Philip Glass? And um, and I thought about that, and I had a dream about it. And in a way, at the time, the dream was like a sort of crazy dream of me and him collaborating together, uh, devising together. And I never really knew whether it would happen, but now I can look back and go, yes, the show did happen. Philip did write. Uh, a, a, a lot of wonderful music for the show so it's on some levels it's about the, the dreaming level of reality and how that can manifest into something that really is exists here in consensus mm -hmm. reality and is a show that has some dates that you and some lines that I have to try and remember and so on and so on so it is about creativity in that sense about the relationship of dreaming and dreams and dreamland and how they get manifested. Um, and also across time as well. So it also traces um, my first initial dreams about becoming a theater maker, right from being a young boy. And then at college, when I was first interested in Philip's music and was slightly obsessed by it. Um, and actually there is this rather wonderful for me very precious journey of how Philip's music has been part of my life and sometimes that's been as a as a, an admirer and a listener but then I was very lucky to actually get to a point where I was working with his operas directing his operas and then a dream about collaborating with him I had and then it eventually ended up with me thinking, what would it be like? What was it like when Philip first made shows when he was doing stuff in, in downtown New York and in rehearsal rooms? And he talks about writing music for Beckett, you know, 
yeah. these early days. And I had a fantasy about, can I get Philip Glass back into a rehearsal room? And not just the big operas where he sits on his own and he writes the music, but can I get him into a room and collaborate with him? And so that it's kind of, if there's any kind of jeopardy in the show, in its narrative, it's like, will I manage to get Philip Glass into the La Mama rehearsal space and muck about like we do it improbable? And I imagine muck about like he did when he was first making his first extraordinary pieces of theatre. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, people forget. I think Philip Glass worked as a cab driver and did some plumbing, I think, for a friend of right. mine, Bonnie Maranka. Yeah from PAJ yes. and uh, while studying also in, in, in Paris. Um, um, did he join you in the rehearsal space? Uh, he, well, you know, I don't want to, uh, spoiler alert. Um, yes, yeah, because if, if he hadn't, the show would never have happened. <laughs> so it, it is the story of how it almost didn't happen, but it did in the end. What did you dream? Can you can you tell us what, what, was, what was the dream? What did you see? You know, it, it's... Um, it was a fantasy uh, that I had, and I again I talk about this in the show in the flotation tank. So one of the places that when you get really busy, it's quite hard to find space to dream, and hard to find space for waking dreams. Um, and uh, I I go and I go and float in a flotation tank for many reasons. It really helps my pelvis. So those mm -hmm. of you who have any kind of pelvic and muscular troubles, it really helps floating in a flotation tank. But it's one of the best places for me to dream. And it's like meditation for free. Uh, it takes you down to these deeper levels. And whilst I was in the tank, um, I've had a couple of Philip Glass dreams in the tank. The first was the juggling balls in uh, at Gnarton. And this was a, a, a dream I had where I saw myself doing puppetry and those of you who know some of our shows know that we use materials animating materials in our puppetry shows and in Satyagraha the opera about Gandhi we used newspaper and whatever and I got an image of the the um puppetry me doing puppetry on stage using kind of paper or tissue paper and it was like these kind of wispy images and then the next bit of a dream was I heard, um, I saw this piano and it was playing and it was me and a piano on stage. And then I realized it was Philip Glass music. And then I realized it was actually Philip Glass at the piano. So my dream was actually me and him on stage together. And I, I you know, when we first started doing our improvised puppetry shows, we would do them in you know, small fringe spaces and the, It was kind of a dream about being in a, in I guess what in America in New York would be an off off Broadway space. Me and Philip Glass hanging out in an off Broadway space, whilst I did some puppetry, <laughs> and he played the piano. So that was the dream I had, and that was all I had about the show, just that one, that one fantasy, that kind of waking dream. So uh, John McGrath dared me to go and say, "Well, go and ask Philip." So I, I went and asked Philip, and this that's the kind of the dare to see if that would actually manifest as a real show. So it, it's there, it's happened, the show's there, and uh, there is some puppetry in the show with beautiful newspapers and animation, tissue paper. Actually, it's tissue paper with the score of the show printed on it, so it looks like very beautiful manuscript, music manuscript. And there are moments where Philip is on stage with me in a very magical way uh, that Philip came up with as a solution. So I'm not going to share that. No. Nope. So it doesn't spoil how it happens. But that dream of me and Philip on stage together uh, did happen in a certain oh. way. So fantastic. So it's a it's a stage meditation, one could say. I understand also 10 meditations on life and death are kind of connected to a Taoist wisdom, part concert, part performance for everybody who does not know. Phelim is a great actor. He's a great puppet player and he's the director. He's on stage. He's in his own dream. And it's interesting. So much of the contemporary theater is inspired by our outside world, the kind of 
um, hyper social realism like the great play love we just saw at the Amory um, but he uh, goes into the dream world to the inside in a way like the great Kung Ju operas of China where you know people it's, people have dreams and dreams while they dream because the outside world you know who wants to look at it they think art has to connect to that it is our most inner self and the most human one can be um, as an expression of an artist so it is um, and quite great for everybody to come and see what do you have it? an artist has a dream now you can see what he did with it I think it is so fantastic so worth um, to spend time a film is a master um, of theater. We know him, uh, of course, of what he called the junk opera, the shock headed Peter with the tiger lilies. That was a sensation that went around the world, a fantastic work. And he did so many operas, Mozart operas, uh, the servants, also the two masters, the Goldoni. So, this idea of juggling commedia is um, in him, the great Akhenaten at the Met opera that was here. And of course, the Sachagra, he's a great master um, of theater. Uh, he's just worked on my neighbor Totoro, you know, the uh, Miyazaki uh, adaptation. But so um, well, let's maybe before we talk about the, your great theater company or the improbable theater, when did it all start? Where was it? You say you were like a kid or you listened to them. When did you start thinking, this is what I want to do and why do you do theater? You know, I, I think I'm probably very lucky. Um, my mum, my mum nurtured a love in theatre in me at a very early age, and uh, again, there's lots of it's interesting kind of being asked these questions because I answer them all in the show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so okay. If, you, if people have to leave, don't worry. Just come and see the show, and you'll you'll hear these answers to these questions. You know, there was never a point I can remember where I I didn't know that I was going to do theatre. I always knew I was going to be a performer. I think um, the way that I make theatre, I didn't know about. I thought I was going to be like a, a Shakespearean actor. Um, and uh, because I, I was taken to the theatre by my mom and uh, I was taken to see, you know, some shows with, you know, I, I saw Laurence Olivier at uh, an uh, early age performing on stage and I saw as growing up a kid in Manchester, I saw these shows at the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester. And I knew that that was what I was going to do. And my parents, there's a kind of interesting thing there. I wanted to go to drama school. And my parents said, no, don't, don't go to drama school. Maybe think about doing that later. You should get a degree. And so I ended up going to Manchester, sorry, to Middlesex Polytechnic. Um, and uh, it was a performing arts degree and it didn't exist, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and it was actually a, a place where I learned not just to become an actor, but to learn how to collaborate and how to devise and how to make, make it up really. So I came out of Middlesex, then Polytechnic, now university, kind of going, oh, I'm gonna make theatre. I'll just, I, I don't know how to get a job or how to get auditions. I'll just make theater. So in my last year, I made a show um, and we used Philip Glass music for that show. And so that track of Philip's music goes right back to when I first left college. Um, but I was lucky, I think, in that I didn't ever go and be an actor and I have to sit by the phone and wait for a, whether I get a job. I just made shows. So when I, I was not kind of in a show, I thought, well, I'll, I'll make another show and I'll think about what that dream was. And early on, I didn't have access to playwrights. So we adapted stuff, you know. So I went, well, let's adapt this, this uh, Ian McEwan story. Uh, we adapted um, a great uh, narrative poem by Ted Hughes called Gaudete that happened at the Almeida Theatre. And Pierre Audi, who's at the mm. Army, uh, let us do this crazy three and a half hour adaptation of this Ted Hughes poem. And then I just kept making, you know, so I, I didn't ever, luckily didn't ever break stride. I'm not sure whether it would be possible nowadays to do yeah. the kind of route that I did when I first started in the eighties. Um, so uh, I always knew I was gonna be a performer and I'm still doing it. 
I then started directing quite a lot. I do miss performing when I'm directing. I like, I love storytelling. I love being on stage. So um, this show is kind of like, it's a catch up with me sharing some of the ideas about how you make things, how creativity happens. Um, there's a thing that you mentioned, Jung, and uh, one of the teachers that I mention in this show is this extraordinary guy, now a friend called uh, Arnold Mindell. And I don't know if you know about Arnold Mindell. He's he's based in in uh, Portland, Oregon. And Arnold Mindell was a, um, a Jungian. Um, he was actually a quantum physicist who became a Jungian therapist. And he, he uh, created this um, school of work around a thing he called dream body work. And dream body work was the study of dreams and their relationship to body symptoms and how there is a dreaming process within the body that often comes through symptoms or body symptoms. And uh, I got interested in his work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, he uh, has these three levels of existence, right? It's this uh, beautiful uh, model that, that actually our set is based on. So Arnie, Arnie's work, he's continued to develop his work. You know, he's, he, he's connected the psychology to quantum physics in a way that's actually, I think, really extraordinary. And because he really is a quantum physicist, mm -hmm. it's not like, it's a very scientific, actually, process work. The work that he does because yeah, it's he about talks. signals and um feedback and whatever it's very scientific in its way yes you're gonna say he, he talks about the conscious reality the yeah. dream world but then what he calls the essence what's the, what's the essence? yeah so there's a there's a there's a kind of there's these three his model of consciousness is these three levels of of reality i'm going to do a, a quick picture yes please yeah, look this is very good well, so, good that we are in Jay Wegman's office, you know, where we can see that. So can you see this? It's like a cone. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then at the top is consensus reality. I'll probably spell this wrong. Consensus this reality. And then there's dreamland. And then down at the bottom is essence level. And this, I do think, can you hear me? Yes. I do think for me, this is, it's a brilliant sort of- Speak psychology. to the camera. Maybe that might be better, yeah. Mm. It's a brilliant um, kind of psychology model. And it's actually, it's actually uh, a model for what he calls deep democracy. So it relates to the kind of social activism work that Arnie and Amy Mindell do. And that works called world work. So if you Google deep democracy and world work, you'll find out about that. But this cone is a fantastic model for how one looks at issues um, and uh, important kind of world issues and conflicts and so on. So at the top of that cone, there is consensus reality. See, and that's like a surface layer. And that's like everyday life. It's what we agree reality is. It, and it's it's where... Um, kind of everyday problems, conflicts uh, uh, happen. And it's the, it's the kind of diverse world. It's the world of, of where we're separate. So we, we have our separate identities, we have our separate issues and the polarities of the world happen. And uh, in the show, I say this, it, it's actually the, what the Buddhists call the realm of 10,000 things. So it's the world of difference. And then lower down here is dreamland. And dreamland is, um, that's the world of the, the kind of Jungian dream world. Of course, it's dreaming at uh, night, but it's also dreamland as a presence now, like our waking dreams and our fantasies, our sense of atmospheres and emotions that we often marginalize. So consensus reality does works hard to marginalize dreamland, but dreamland tries to communicate with us through different signals. So Arnie talks about how it might come through a, a kind of double signal in our body. So it might it might be that we say we're happy, but actually we've got a, a, a feeling in our face that's different. Or we say that we get on with someone really well, but actually 
there's a, a, a kind of another double signal there. So dreamland communicates up there, but also it's the world of, of um, dream figures, mythic stories, histories. So in terms of an issue, it would be like the histories behind that issue. So uh, and the ghost roles that are around around a certain issue. So you, you, you talked about, you were talking to me earlier about Martin Siegel. Mm -hmm. You know, he was mentioned earlier and he's like a ghost role in your organization. He's, 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 he's not no longer with us. That's right. Yeah. 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 But he is actually still a ghost role. So, he, you know, he's a ghost role. And then down at the bottom of the cone is essence level. And that's where everything is connected. So that's like, uh, you know, the Tao that can't be said. It's in quantum physics, physics it's, it's um, David Bohm's unbroken wholeness. You know, it, it's this sense of when we are disconnected. Now in dreamland, things are more fluid. So in dreamland, I, in like in my dreams and my fantasies, I have a fantasy about being on stage with Philip Glass. And I go, oh, that maybe that's, you know, but it's not really, a, you know, it's not consensus reality. And then at essence level, everything is 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 connected. Essence level and dreamland communicate up to us in consensus reality all the time. And these three levels are present all the time. So deep democracy says, yes, deal with that issue in consensus reality, but also deal with that issue in dreamland, in its histories. And in the pro the accidents and the strange fantasies that you have in relationship to people, and then down at essence level, you get these moments where you might need you might sense that you're everybody's connected. So it's no longer the the ten thousand things; it's the totality of everything. It's one oneness. So if you're going to do world work and you're going to work on these big world issues, you have to kind of address the issues on all three of these levels. Now, I did this opera, Satyagraha, about Gandhi and about Gandhi's concept of, of Satyagraha, about uh, social activism and how you work on yourself in order to work on these outer world issues. And it became very clear to me that in this opera, Philip, he does include the consensus reality a story of Gandhi, you know, the historical moments that happened. But he also includes this bit from the Bhagavad Gita that, that Philip, uh, that, uh, that uh, Gandhi was obsessed by. He carried the Bhagavad Gita. And the, the mythic stories in the, in the, of Krishna in the, in the Bhagavad Gita is on stage at the same time. And then there are these moments in the show where it connects to essence level in the music where you go there's this moment of silence and everyone has been taken to this other realm where everything is connected so i thought i know i think this opera is extraordinary because it really deals with this subject on all three of these levels so that's why i kind of that that's for me that's where philip's work and arnie's work connects because what i know is that philip's work if you give over to it and if you so, sort of surrender to it it takes you to these dreamland landscapes and he can do an opera that's about a historical figure like Einstein or Gandhi or Akhenaten but he will include these other levels and the way that people connect to these lower levels and the way and this is also interesting at the moment we need theater, we need music, we need things like opera in order to be able to navigate these realms. We can't connect to them and we can't include them unless we use theater and unless we use music. So at these moments, and especially in the UK at the moment where we find ourselves like embattled up in consensus reality, about the arts, about funding for the arts, about whether music, whether opera, whether theatre is important, and whether the arts are important. And it's easy to find oneself going, why am I, how can I say that the arts are important when there are these 
big things going on in the world that are important, like, you know, conflicts about the National Health Service. But I know in this model, it says these big elements of issues like, like the dreamland issues and the essence level issues, if shift and change is ever going to happen, if awareness, it's an awareness model around these issues, we need these lower levels. And that's why actually theatre and opera and music is even more important that we, that we, uh, we, we fight for it and we support it. And I say more important because in consensus reality, it's easy for it to get marginalised and to, um, for the world to tell us it's not important, but it is important. And that's why, you know, uh, there's a, uh, this thing when people in Ukraine or, you know, uh, during the Second World War, when people were in these extreme tortured situations, music becomes incredibly meaningful and important at these moments. And it's because of that. It's because sense of, of meaning and sense of importance and our place in the world and place in this crazy world that we're living in is given to us by these deeper things. So uh, it, there's a question about what this shows about. It's about those crazy things going on in my mind, those obsessions. <clears throat> and I, 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 there's a question I think I had when making this show was, uh, there are some ideas there that I think are really important ideas. Can you put them into a theater show? There's, on some levels, that's quite an intellectual idea. Uh, there, but can you communicate it to people in theatre? So at the end of the show, can they understand what this con feels like? Not just understand it in their head. Sorry, Frank, I do ramble sometimes. I... Not at all. I, <laughs> it was a, a, a very lucid, important, I think, and significant statement about the art and the world and the place of the artist um, and the yeah. very powerful, actually, advocacy. And I have to really think about it. And for the audience you're know, listening in now, there's an artist who has worked since, I think, 1984, like 40 years. And this is the piece where he said, this is what we need now. This is, I think, is worth your time. Uh, and he's sharing something of significance. And this is one of the great functions of theater. And I truly uh, believe that you are right. Uh, in the time also after Corona, um, in the time where big metropolises like New York or London, Berlin, Paris, they are struggling um, um, to, to make sense, to create meaningful life. Where are we going to? Where are we now? Where do we come from? And I think the portals that open mm. through music or, or theater or opera that combines it, um, of course, all these things, you know, they play in a shamanistic way, the old old fashioned way, you know, where theater perhaps performance started the first person where he was buried and someone put a deer skin uh, over it and, and had an idea of an afterlife and put something with them and, and created something for a moment. And this is what you're doing. And I think this is what we need. And we need uh, more of this. And we also have to see how can we connect it uh, to to um, life. I think you talk also about of, of this Japanese idea of a kintsuji, you know, if something is broken, embrace it. Tell us a bit, you know, is that part of that? Do you feel this is uh, the, the gold we put in and the broken fragments of our lives, of our world? I think so. You know, I, I talked, I mean, one, it, it's a different kind of um, narrative, I would say. So the, lin the more linear narrative that uh, that is, I guess one could uh, uh, stereotypically say it's a more Western narrative, this linear narrative. It, it's exciting, you know, and it's powerful. But at the same time, I guess that there there are there are different kinds of narratives. Um, and I would say, you know, the broken pot <laughs> is a different kind of of narrative, and the broken pot that's put back together. In Kintsugi, where it's it's glued together with the gold, and then it becomes more beautiful and more precious. That's a wonderful for me. That's a wonderful uh, healing story. Uh, for you know, we talked about one's career. <laughs> There's no way I have had any kind of linear logical uh, come out of drama school and have a career. Career. I've had a very um, strange 
uh, broken up career that that's but there is a meaning to that and there is a story to that that might be a little bit different there's a there's a an essay that's a big inspiration to 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 us in improbable and to, and to, certainly to my wife who's a writer uh, Matilda Liza and it, it's a, an Ursula Le Guin uh, essay I don't know if you know it Frank it's called no. the, it's so good you should read it it's brilliant and Ursula Le Guin she's so wonderful she wrote this uh, essay called the carrier bag theory of fiction and I think it was written in the 80s this essay and she talks about the this uh, western narrative she says that, that there is a, a theory, you know, there is a, a, a more common theory that the first object was a weapon. And, you know, like in the Stanley Kubrick film, it's, mm -hmm. it's, the bone, it's the bone that becomes the cudgel. And she says, actually, anthropologists say the first, the first tool, the first object was not a weapon. It was a bag. And it was a bag to gather things in. So the, 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 the hunter-gatherer now, now reverses the gatherer-hunter. Um, that's the first thing. So this, this concept of gathering things together and putting them together and see what they make together is a different kind of story. And she, in her, her book, she argues, she gives it a kind of gender uh, narrative that the male arrow, the, we ne the male weapon, sort of linear narrative is different from the, the the more female narrative of the gathering collection of stories a collection of things and how do these things fit together like they would in a dream you know when we dream our, our dream world places these things together in a way we go i don't know why that thing is with that now or why that person has been combined with that other person or why they're in a place that they're not in, and that understanding of the world, which is a, a more uh, collage-like way, I think is important to us now because it, 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 it's an invitation to different kinds of connections. And to, we need these connections more so than this. We're going to solve it all in one way. And there's going to be a hero who solves it all for us. But actually, there's a different kind of mindset which puts these things together. So that essay, I love that essay. And I, I think the Kintsugi idea of a vase that's a collection of pieces that get put together again. And the thing that's broken, the accident that happened, has come up from dreamland, this accident that happens in dreamland to us. You know that thing that interrupts your day because you had a plan of how it was going to go. That accident it stops your plan, but it's actually a gift if we can open ourselves to it. So Kintsugi obviously is, is a, it's an invitation to go that terrible thing that happened, that beautiful vase that you dropped could even be more beautiful if you embraced the cracks. And, the, and I know that my life is full of cracks <laughs> and it's full of breakages, you know, and there's even one I mentioned in the show about, you know, I have this, I, I got asked to direct a Broadway show. That didn't happen the way I was, thought it was going to happen. But that's actually one of the cracks, you know, and Leonard Cohen, it's the, where the light comes in, all those things. I, I, I know that, that, that it was one of the most painful things that happened to me in my career, being fired from a show. It actually was one of the biggest gifts ever because it took me down to essence level at that point and went, what do you really care about? What do you, what do you want to really make theatre about? What kind of shows do you really want to make? And uh, uh, I, I think that little model, that idea of Kintsugi where you go, ah, it's gold. It doesn't get any easier. It's not like, you go, oh, now I understand. <laughs> there will, there's plenty more vases to break in our lives, plenty more shows, plenty more mistakes. That unfolding process is there for us, but uh, I'm trying to learn how to do it. I, I'm in about to be 60, I'll be in my 60th year, still don't know how to make theatre. I still don't know how to do it, but that's why I still want to do it. 
Oh, amazing, amazing. And we can just come and look at the work and uh, take some time out. Um, I also would like to talk <clears throat> about the improbable theater uh, mm -hmm. where you um, come out from. I think uh, Julian Crouch, Lee Simpson, uh, Nick Sweeting, you, you uh, started it. Um, <clears throat> in a way, one could almost describe it as an octopus. You know, we know octopus feel uh, their brains is distributed and all the arms and uh, all of it. So um, it, it's a company that produced incredible work. I read a product sticky, you reached 250,000 people. You did The Tempest, The Animo, A Time of Theater of the Blood, the great Philip Glass operas, Mozart operas. But um, you have initiatives, um, I think, which is of significance also for a U.S. audience or any audience in the world of what a theater company is or could be about these tentacles. And I'm just going to read through them and then maybe we talk of some of them. There's something called uh, Through the Door, which is kind of an inclusive uh, uh, outreach uh, uh, movement for, you know, binary uh, LGBT. I don't, know, I, I don't know if I understand right. How, how can we connect the communities? Yeah. Mothers who make. Mm -hmm. What about mothers who are artists? You know, how do they make their work? How can we support them? It's not even just in London or nationally. It's, I think, even globally, if I understood that right. You do something called open space, open space events, and you do one in New York, if I understand right. They are, you'd have conversations. They are called uh, uh, devoted and disgruntled about the state of the theaters in, the, in London, the UK. You get people... Um, um, together, like, uh, I don't know, conversations, I mentioned like Joseph Boyce did, who I knew, and who did these great conversations, and he was in the middle, and it works after an hour or two, um, you have something called hire us, where you say the business, you want to hire us, uh, you want to learn how artists work, we don't know what comes out, but we don't make fake plans, we pretend to stick to it if they don't work, because we regroup, you um um, and then you have uh, something called the uh, play Bambino. It's uh, for young kids who are six to 18 months old. You know, it's not, you know, as an operatic a music adventure um, for them, you create something it's called the gathering. If I understand right, you want to have a 500 acre farm, part of an organic farm, but also a gathering where people come, come it, it, researching the big question, uh, uh, what is home? Uh, it's called a bore, a place in Kent. So um, it's uh, just uh, incredible what you uh, have all around you and then stuff that manifests on stage, like here at the Skirball, what you didn't do at Broadway or what Broadway did not allow you to do, we can see. Um, so, but how is that all connected? Tell us a little bit. I mean, that's a big question, really. I mean, I think, you know, what connects it is improvisation, I think. And, uh, uh, you know, I here's one narrative, which is that when I first left college, those early shows I made, they were like, let's make a show and let's make it the best show ever. You know, let's really... Like, and and uh, I, I did that for a few years. And on certain level, that is like a plan. And I kind of knew the shows were going to be good. And you would go, let's do this and we'll plan out what the show is going to be like. And weirdly, it was almost like I knew what the show was going to be before it happened. So I thought, well, what's the point of making it? <laughs> I know already. Um, and then I had this life-changing moment where I saw a small advert in the back of a stage newspaper. And it was literally, it was only this big, it was a tiny little advert. And it, it said, uh, improvisation workshop in Dorset uh, with um, Keith Johnston. And I, I knew of Keith Johnston because I'd read his wonderful book, Impro. And Keith Johnston started the writer's group at the Raw Court. Um, in the in the 50s 60s and uh he he also had a connection to beckett as well and keith started researching narrative and playwriting and he worked with playwrights and he started doing improvisation with them to study how narrative works and then he had a company called theater machine which were the first in the uk what we would call impro in america it's kind of called improv and the, the lineage there is through Viola Spolin and Second City. In the UK, it was through Keith and, and Impro and Theatre Machine and, and the, the groups like uh, Omelette Broadcasting who grew out of that. 
Now, on that workshop, I was there for 10 days. And basically, in a shamanic way, um, uh, Keith kind of reorganized my brain. He, he disassembled my brain. And I was like, oh, the world's different from how I think it is. Because I went from working on shows and thinking, let's make this work. work, work. And I, I was then in a, suddenly in a scenario through having in, got introduced to Impro where I was making five, six shows a week, every night. And some of them were, were good. Some of them were, were absolutely really terrible. But I also knew that I discovered that if you did a really terrible show, you give up, then the next night would be brilliant. Really brilliant. So I got like schooled and trained in improvisation. And because I, I always saw improvisation not as comedy necessarily, you know, I love comedy, but I saw it as theater and that as Keith does or did, because he's just died literally like two weeks ago. Um, he wanted to reshape and change what theater was like. He wanted it to be alive, wanted it to be in the moment, and he wanted it to be as exciting as, as sport or as, as he saw it in those early days, working class theater, wrestling, you know. He, he, why is theater not as exciting as, as, as wrestling? And so that, the skills and the meta skills, the feeling skills that come from improvisation absolutely connect all our shows. So that's also about curiosity and research. So you go, here's an idea. How can, and this is what Keith would do. He'd go, how can I find out whether the audience are bored or not? And he would literally try and create exercises in order to do that. And, uh, he, he was like a strange maverick scientist, like Arnie Mendel is, you know, these wonderful people who are really researching theatre as a live event, experiential research that's happening every time it goes in front of an audience. And I think that that's what I learned from Keith, is to, to keep curious and to keep trying things. So when you get a crazy idea like, could you really put juggling in an opera all the way through it? And you go, oh my God, that's crazy. And then you go, oh, well, that's so crazy. It's so stupid, that idea. Maybe it's really good. I didn't even like juggling very much at that point when I was thinking it. But I thought, no, no, there's something there. I can feel it in my body. Trust that intuition, but really find out what works. Go into a, a, a R&D and play with juggling and play the music and see if there are connections and so on. So that's improvisation as far as I'm concerned. One imp aspect of improvisation is, is research. Another aspect of, of improvisation is that it's a conversation. I've got a really good story I want to tell you. We did this show called Spirit at the New York Theatre Workshop. And it was a divine show. It was about conflict and three performers, me and Lee and Guy, on stage. And it was a show about our own conflicts. So we would do the show. At the beginning of the show was improvised and the end of the show was improvised. And um, so we would pick up on the audience, what was happening in the audience at the beginning. Then we'd do the show. And at the end, we'd kind of pick up on things that happened in the show, mistakes that happened in the show, things that had gone wrong, things in the audience. And on press night, uh, the night that the reviewers were in, this enormous fly at the beginning of the show was in the New York Theatre Workshop and it flew around and flew around. And the stage was a big slope with these holes in that we popped out of, the three of us, and it landed right next to Lee. And we all looked at this fly uh, and it flew off. And we talked about the fly for a bit. And every now and again throughout the show that evening, the fly would fly by. And it became part of the conversation, the improvised conversation. And at the end of the show, the fly came back. <laughs> we talked about the fly at the end of the show. And our lighting designer, who's here lighting down of glass, said he was sitting between these, these two old ladies in the show. 
And after the show, one of them said, I hated that show. <laughs> I hated that show. And the other one looked slightly disappointed and turned to him and said, oh, what about the bit with the fly? And said, that was a mechanical fly. So there was a person in the audience who thought it was more likely that we'd built a radio controlled mechanical fly to be part of our show than it was to improvise and include a fly into your show. Um, you know, improvisation is actually just a conversation in the moment. One of the hardest things to do is stay relaxed and have a conversation on stage in front of an audience, of course, and to tell a story. But that's also part of improvisation. And a conversation, um, uh, David White, the poet, talks about this. You know, a conver an authentic conversation is something which changes you. So at the beginning of the conversation, you start out at a certain place, you interact, and by the end of it, you are changed. If you just talk to each other and you're not, that's not a conversation. So I feel like theater should be a conversation. I feel like performance on stage should be a conversation between all the elements. And uh, you know, great performers know that it's an interaction. But I also feel like conversation is what we need in the world. So this brings in open space technology and another extraordinary elder that I, I found through reading one of his books, uh, Harrison Owen, who created open space technology. And on a very simple level, open space technology is a way of collaborating. And what it is, is you gather in a big circle, you agree that you're gonna self-organize for two days or a different period of time, but ideally you do it over two days and you get all the things you want to work on, declare them in the middle, put them on the wall like a timetable, self-organize and work on them all and then get back in a circle and find out where you got to and what happens next. So that's basically one great, big, diverse, connected conversation, like an incredible, creative, artistic, if it's an artistic theme, beehive. Everybody's working together and the system is being connected up and people having real conversations and in the moment are going, ah, talk to that person. They know, talk to that person. The per and I read Harrison's book about open space and how he created it and the principles that it works. It's basically one massive creative improvisation game. And I went, I know this already. It's what I've been trying to do in my rehearsal rooms for years. But this is to deal with all these issues that I get scared and don't know how to deal with in consensus reality. Because I think I can't deal with that. I'm too busy making shows. I'll just do the art. So 18 years ago, I think, I wrote this invitation. I'm devoted and disgruntled about theatre. I love it. I'm so frustrated that we don't really behave like a community. Can we be a community better? And the thing, I wrote, sent that invitation out and I think the first time we did it about 250 people came. And now we've been doing it annually as a big annual event. We've done it all over the world in different ways. We do get invited into businesses to do it as a way of businesses collaborating and working on issues. But it's basically improvisation, improvisation, improvisation. So it may look like the product at the end of the day when you look at the Met, Aknarton, there's an extraordinary thing with an orchestra and jugglers and amazing singers and the technical design and so on. And, and then you look at a kind of smaller show like Dow of Glass, quite a big show, but it's, or even one of our improvised shows that's totally improvised, like Lee's just directed an improvised musical, totally improvised with a band that they come from the same source. So they're down at impos down there in the essence and they come up here and as they get closer to consensus reality, there's a diversity to what they are, but they come from the same source material. So in our Philip Glass operas, I go Satyagraha, Agnaton, they look so different from each other. You know, Agnaton's the biggest, most over the top, like spectacle. Satyagraha is, is this kind of 
simple materials, you know, the newspaper, the sticky tape, frugal in its kind of like uh, humble materials that then get bigger, look so different, but actually the essence and the, the kind of ethos of each of those shows, absolutely the same thing. And uh, on a certain level, there's simple things like at the end of, at the beginning of our day, in our collaborative kind of process, we'll get in a circle and we'll do a check-in and anything that's alive in people can be raised. And it might be about the show. It might be about something that's what's going on in their life at the moment that they're worried about, that they have a, a relative who's ill or that there's something happened to them on the subway where they got shouted at, you know, by this, you know, a, a, a horrible incident or something that they're concerned about, something they're excited about. They all go in the pot. They all go in the pot. We don't say leave it outside the room. It all goes in the pot and it becomes part of the show. And it's also how you look after the show. So Agnarton, we first made it eight years ago. It's at the e &O. Many of the performers are the same, but there's a whole group of performers who are new. And you need to take care of the ethos of that. And that's, we use things like open space to do that. I'm trying to pick up the threads of, of, of the things that you mentioned. The other thing that you oh. mentioned was the gathering. Mm -hmm. So it feels like we've been an, a kind of itinerant company. We've traveled around a lot. We, you know, we've been very lucky. We've toured the world. We've done shows in different places. We very often go into places, you know, organizations and bring a certain way of working in. And sometimes that's embraced by those organizations and, and it, it, it's a nurturing thing and it's 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 been really appreciated the met you know i think they thought we were a bit crazy when we first worked there but they now they're so supportive of how we work and they know that it creates a great atmosphere around our shows and in the rest of the building so that's important in our story we feel like we're arriving at an eldership moment as a company and as ourselves you know as i say i'm i'm 60 this year um, how can one pass those things on? How can one pass on the ways of working? So um, we thought to ourselves, actually, we do want a space. We do want a what might become a building. But that building needs to be a creative space, not a venue, but like what in Europe would be called a creation center. So there's a model, as you probably know, Frank, in things like circus and uh, in, in outdoor arts where they talk about a creation center. And even someone like Lepage, you know, he has his fire station. Le, dia, le diamant. Yeah. And uh, someone was mentioning... Uh, um, um, Watermill by Robert Wilson. Yes, exactly. These spaces that are like, they're kind of, like, you know, the kind of DreamWorks kind of creative hubs that... Pixar labs where you you explore you know the creature shop where things get tried out that feeling so there's a dream of a building that might happen and a space that might happen and it's actually quite a big vision and it, it's about like bringing 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 it home as it were but also a place that people might come to and you might hold open spaces you might hold world work forums the deep democracy world work forums, but you might engage with the local people and bring them in and connect to them and teach impro and teach circus skills, all those things. How do you create a legacy project in a way? So there was this idea and we, we thought, what's it gonna be called? Let's call it the gathering because it needs to be to start from the people. And also there is a feeling of wanting it to connect to nature and that we, we thought, where will this happen? And we went on a little, myself and Matilda Liza, uh, my wife, associate director in Improbable, she, she and I, and with our kids, we went around the UK and we'd put an invitation out. We said, oh, maybe we'll find a place. And we ended up coming right full circle back to Kent. And we got introduced to this place called Boar Place in Kent, which is an extraordinary, a place which has a little conference center and it has a regenerative uh, uh, farm and an ethos founded by 
this wonderful couple in the uh, 70s, um, the Jennifer Waits and her husband, he's no longer alive. And it was an alternative place to look at how we might live with nature differently and learn from it and how that might help the world. And there was an arts program there that started at the beginning, but now no longer exists. And they said, Jennifer wants the arts program to happen again. Maybe this is a good fit. So we've gone there and there's a, a footprint, which is what you need in, in, in that part of the world. You need a, a building to have already existed. So there's like a potential for two buildings to be built. So we have this big dream and the dream's gonna manifest from here into consensus reality. And that dream's gonna happen through conversation and holding open space events and then starting to teach and starting to do maybe temporary buildings there that we, we'll use collaborators to help us build them. And through that, we'll find out how the building is designed. So there's also a kind of alternative emergent architectural process that, that can happen. And the two things we want to happen in kind of parallel worlds so that when the building has been built, it will be something that has been built in conversation with the artists and the people who are going to end up using it. And it may be a finished building or it may be a building that stays flexible and changes or, but it will have been from in conversation with people and in conversation with the landscape that's there. So it feels like an exciting uh, new kind of third act for our improbable story to create this place that people will come. And it, it, we talked about it being an arc for the arts, you know, at this time where all these freelancers who were lost, especially during the pandemic, all these people who don't necessarily belong to an organization, who don't have a home, will be able to come and connect and find a space where they do feel like they belong. And we know many of those people already through our devoted and disgruntled events. And we know them internationally. They could come internationally and connect with us. And there's a, 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 a network of people who also feel like they live in this, you know, parallel world where they don't quite fit in where they are, but they know that they've got a global connection to other outsiders. Um, that, that network that we want to become a little hub for, a focused, strong hub for, feels like a good dream for the last act of Improbable. Mm. What is home? What do you think? How would you define it? You know, I think one, one, a definition of home is is a place that two um, I, 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 uh, two things. Matilda, my wife, will remember the quote. Oh, it's in that wonderful book about spaces. Uh, uh, home is a space which allows the person in it to dream. So it's a place you feel safe enough, um, and you feel like you belong enough in order to feel able to dream in that space. So when you don't feel at home, you don't necessarily feel able to dream because you're too, uh, consensus reality is maybe too dangerous. So I, so I would say it's home is a place where you feel that you belong. Home is a process. So I know from an early age, I didn't feel like I belonged in the, uh, everyday ordinary world but I did feel like I belonged when I was on stage and I know that home is is theater to me so it's all these different things so in a way home's a process it's a process of connection so you may not have a house but you may be able to feel at home if you feel connected to people and you feel supported and nurtured by people so home is important i think and one maybe one test bit of research here one of the tests for whether people do feel at home is whether they feel able to make art whether they feel able to dream oh incredible this is a uh, willie such 
important and significant insights. And um, I do feel this is kind of a changing, you know, conversation. It has a, it has an impact. And I think hopefully also um, for, for our viewers. And um, and I think we all are wrestling with questions now. You know, how do we change also after the experience of COVID and Corona, how do we get connected yeah. closer to nature and how do we represent it? Animals, nature, flies. Um, we're going to have three upcoming talks. Um, we call them Whole Earth Talks. Thomas Oberender from Berlin, who ran the Festspiel, that came up with that idea. And we're going to, you know, talk with him and Frédéric Aitui from France and Andreas Weber. Um, um, how um, how do we represent that new world they, that, that is really also in danger um, um, through the climate change? It's all very serious. And so far... Um, on stages over centuries, theater has presented interhuman conflicts. And, um, and how do we include the nature, the home, the elderly, children, the bambinos, uh, but also, you know, the plants and the animals. And, and I think it is an important conversation we're going to have. And you found one answer how to, you know, to um, integrate it or make it as a as a as an essential an essence base of um, of your work. So I'm really interested how this will go and uh, pan out. So people could come one day and visit you and theater artists from around the world and uh, contribute and uh, see you see you working. Um, this is a really a, a stunning. So it was a fantastic uh, a conversation, um, and we had we said it, it it's about an an, an hour. Or so really. Um, and, Philem, thank you uh, so much for sharing and so uh, so insightful and honest also. And um, it's a lot of wisdom in their stuff. You don't really get taught in, in the theater classes as acting and directing, and uh, but so very, um, and very important. Um, again, I think Tower of Class was co-directed by uh, Christy uh, Housley, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Important to, to name. Um, it was commissioned by the Manchester International Festival, the Improbable Perth Festival, Ruhr Festspiele Recklinghausen, Hong Kong New Vision Arts Festival, and Carolina Performing Arts University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, in association with uh, Naomi Milgram, and produced by the Manchester International Festival, the great festival actually, uh, the Improbable and the Royal. Theater exchange that also gives everyone an idea of your network, uh, how you are connected to the world. You know the the the, um, the consensus world. I think on the Buddha statues, you see his little these little twirls, thousands or ten thousand on the head of Buddha that represent you know that outside. Oh yeah, that's very good. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, and um, so, and then, but you zoom then in on that stage for that moment in time where you open again and the space changes. Uh, we listen differently and, uh, and, um, and, and we are open, you know, and to that game you, you are presenting. It's fantastic. So thank you for sharing the things that Jay Wegman um, gave his office. You know, if you want to be an executive yeah. artistic director, this is the great office you get, you know, by the way, you know, at NYU. about that but um, great that you are there and it's I think important that university you which is brilliant uh, so <laughs> we know a bit more